Hello, good afternoon or good morning if you're joining us uh, out west. We hope you're enjoying your day. Welcome to another episode of The Hangouts on One Soccer's YouTube channel. I'm your host, Asa Raymond. Happy to be joined by Kurt Larson and Oliver Platts. And we have a very special guest with us today. He started out at Sigma. Now he's here back home, starting right back for Toronto FC and the Canadian men's national team, Richie Larea. Welcome to the show. I understand you're, you're back at, with some organized training. What's, what's that been like? Yeah, we've been um, getting in some groups where um, guys are divided amongst the field and we're doing uh, basically all these um, 1v1 um, sessions on our own and just do, doing, going through the basics and all that. So it's been, it's been pretty good. Got two questions from me, uh, Richie. The first one is, you know, as a former player myself, I can only imagine the uh, soreness that you have right now from returning to training after such a long layoff. Has it been painful? Has it been painful at all? Yeah, it's definitely been a, been a little bit rough for me. Uh, I think this is the second week of us uh, doing all these uh, individual trainings, but last week I was pretty sore after each and every session, and I think it's getting a little bit better this week, but uh, still definitely uh, it's going to take some getting used to for me. The second question would be, there's a Peloton bike over your shoulder. I want to know a little bit about those workouts. I want to know how, how far do you go? Would you recommend it to someone like me who's uh, uh, not done much for the last 10 weeks? You know what? The Peloton's amazing. Uh, I know a few guys in the team have it. We've all been uh, hopping on at the same time and trying to beat each other out. So it's been, it's been good. I think it'd be pretty, pretty useful for you. And I support the girl in the commercial too, by the way. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so go ahead, Ollie. Sorry, yeah, yeah, I was going to dive right into it. Richie, let's just maybe reflect a little bit on the last 18 months because it's been a pretty amazing ride for you. Um, you've gone from, obviously, the disappointment of being let go by Orlando and, and then coming to TFC, establishing yourself with the national team and, and being a part of that massive win against the US as well. So <laughs> what's the last 18 months been like for you? Uh, it's been a um, whirlwind of emotions. I always say that it's... Um... Obviously, first and foremost, I'm just so happy to to be back home in Toronto. It's been a, a long time coming. I think I've been away from college and Orlando, maybe just about five years plus. So it's been a a long way um a long way out for me. But it's been it's been amazing, and um I'm so thankful to be playing for such a good organization in Toronto FC, and then also be part of the Canadian men's national team. So it's been um a lot of learning for me, obviously, with a new position and um new teammates um different type of standards here at this club so it's been um a, lo a little bit uh challenging at times for me and i've had to really dig deep and uh find myself um or find a new version of myself to keep up with uh whatever life that i have going on right now so it's been uh very good and i like i've actually liked the um, the challenge because obviously it's helped me um i think on the field and but then also um off the field with my family and all those type of stuff so i think it's been a really um, good eight, 18 months for, for myself personally. Mm -hmm. How many ticket requests are you getting? And is it did it change throughout the year? Yes, um, I get ticket requests from all the way. If we play at 7, I'm still getting them at like 6 p.m. So I'm like <laughs> doing pregame stuff. And I look at my phone. Someone's like, hey, man, I actually want to bring my girlfriend as well. I'm just like, oh. it's it, 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 it gets a bit much, but I try to... Uh, help out as many people as I can because I know how much this means to people so um, especially close to me to come out and see me play in my hometown so um, I don't get too annoyed annoyed by all the requests I try to get as many as I can yeah big highlight at BMO Field as well that 2-0 uh, win uh, for the men's national team uh, what you, what will you remember from that moment in that game in particular yeah, I think uh, the biggest thing for me was just um, a change of momentum for the group. I think it was even before that. I think at the Gold Cup, obviously, an unfortunate way to exit after. I know they're up 2-0, but um, I think you've seen the momentum change from there just in the players that the group has. It's um, a very, very talented uh, Canadian national team group. And I'm, I'm not just saying this because I'm within the group right now, but I think it will, or as of right now, is up there with uh, one of the best groups for the, the national teams had so far so just with all the young guys that you have and then you have a good core group of leaders that are you could say veteran who aren't even that old either so it's um a pretty young and good group so 
I don't know. It's very exciting. And then, um, I, I mean, from that game, I just obviously the score line sticks up because we, it's the first time we had beat them in 34 years. And I think um, I'm sure you, all three of you guys watched it. But anyone else that did could see how um, just how much higher of a level we were playing than them. So it was um, that's what uh, made me the happiest. It could have finished one. Yeah. nothing. I still would have been extremely proud of the group or it could have been five nothing but just the way we played it was so fearless and you know aggressive we were attacking it wasn't you know what people say the Canada of old where we're playing against a good team let's sit back and see if we can get one and then um dig it up from there but you saw you know this new type of um influential soccer that John is trying to impose on the national team and I think that's a game that you saw it in full force because of how good of the players they had on the field and then also the high quality of players we had on the field as well. So it shows, you know, it's not, um, we didn't go up against a mediocre team and um, beat them to nothing. And it's like, okay, kind of is on the right path. We played against a very good team and beat them to nothing. Yeah. I think it was positive for that reason because it, it gave you guys as a group uh, confidence in knowing that you can compete with the best in CONCACAF uh, and let all the fans know uh, that Canada was capable of getting, you know, such a result, such a big result. However, Richie, as you know, it's not all positive on this show all the time. There was a return leg. It actually was in Orlando where you used to play and the game didn't go so well. Um, can you talk about maybe through your eyes What um, was it not finding goals in the moments where maybe you had a chance to score? What, what did you see in that return leg that kind of was that setback that we were hoping to avoid? Yeah, I think first and foremost, you see how angry and furious they were in the previous results. So they came out, um, again, I would not necessarily say they were playing amazing football, but they were getting into tackles. They were letting us know they were there and, uh, and things like that. So it was um, from that standpoint, they came to play. And I think, um, we did as well, which was um, which was good. But I think letting up that goal as quickly as we did kind of killed things and then shifted the momentum for them. And, you know, um, I think from then on out, we um, started, ch I wouldn't say chasing, but we felt like we needed a goal um, or response really quickly when I don't think we, now looking back at it, we didn't. We had another 85 minutes to, to play. So I think we... Um, maybe open ourselves up thinking, I mean, with the players that we have, we knew we could, we could hurt them. And in the attack, we could get something back maybe. And I think that kind of um, exposed us again at times where um, we're maybe caught too high up the field and um, they're able to capitalize on some uh, mm -hmm. chances. I was working the sideline for that first game at BMO Field. Uh, I also went to Orlando. I was there on the sideline for that match as well. Uh, the one thing that stood out to me in that first game at BMO Field was the fact that the, the pace was so high, was so intense throughout. Do you feel like you guys matched that in that second match uh, in Orlando? Um, I wouldn't say exactly. No, we didn't. And I, I mean, again, I'm not making excuses, but it's difficult because at that time we have guys that are out of the playoffs, so they're not playing anymore. And mm -hmm. You know, we had uh, obviously starters that were playing on Montreal, playing on Vancouver, who weren't in the playoffs anymore and whatnot. And it was, you know, it was, it's it's difficult to stay match level fitness. I, again, I'm not making excuses. We still could have done a much uh, much better job, but um, we did have um, some things that weren't in our favor at the time, which again, very uh, preventable. But I think that first game, you see everyone's on it because everyone's match fit, everyone's uh, in the rhythm of a season, and it, those it's much easier to get up and start um, than than to do it uh, when guys are maybe have some type of a broken rhythm. And I know guys uh, were taking it extremely seriously and still training and do all that, doing all that they can. But everyone that's played the game knows that nothing beats uh, match fitness. So. Yeah, Richie, I think one of the disappointing things was we, we know Canada was chasing points to try and move up to be in a position to be in that top six to, to get into that, that hex tournament, you know, for, for a chance at World Cup qualification. And of course, there's still a chance at World Cup qualification. But have you been hearing anything coming out of, of CONCACAF and, and really all around the world that World Cup qualifying might actually change? And that could be a benefit that... Uh, uh, that benefits Canada. And you guys could be playing the United States in a World Cup qualification process very soon, if things go your way. 
Yes, yes. Um, I, I saw a little bit on that, and I think that's, yeah, it's good for us because I think after that first game, it's put belief into all of us that we can go uh, head-to-head with the best. So um, I think that was an eye-opening game for us, more importantly, but also for the fans as well. So I think, yeah, there is something like that that comes about. I'm sure that we will be more than capable and willing to get the, the job done. Yeah, well, we know, Richie, this team has a lot of talent and, and potential, and that's been talked about a lot. Um, when we do get back to playing and when we get back to playing international football, whenever that is, um, what do you think are the next steps that this team needs to take in order to you know, be a contender to qualify for World Cups and, and get to go deep in Gold Cups as well? Yeah, I think it has to be that same attitude that everyone saw in the, in the US game. It was a team, again, I said, fearless, brave. We didn't care who we were going up against, you know, because we heard all the different names of the guys that were on the uh, U.S. men's national team. Oh, who's going to contain this guy? Who's going to, you know, we all were like, like, who cares? Like, who cares about what anyone has to say? Let's go out and play. And as long as we do that, we'll be good. And I think we showed that. So I think we have to do the exact same because we know in the rest of CONCACAF and then also outside of the world, there are better players than the, than the ones that we played against. Um, uh, at BMO against the USA so um, you know it's just about being fearless and not really caring about who we're, we're coming up against uh, in the future. Mm-hmm. Uh, turning to uh, TFC a little bit now uh, you played in the last year for two great coaches in this country John Herdman and uh, Greg Vanny uh, with the club side just want to know how their coaching styles compare. I think they're very comparable because um, both teams are very possession orientated and it's um, a lot of vibrance and, you know, soccer that people want to come out and see. So uh, I think that's what made my transition very easy from TFC actually to the national team, because everything I was doing at fullback for TFC is exact same things. John Herdman was asking of his fullbacks at the national team. So it's, they're, um, they're very comparable in um, a lot of ways in, in that sense. Interested to know a little bit more about your transition from Orlando to uh, to Toronto FC. Um, cor- you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but you kind of went into the, the previous preseason just kind of on a trial situation with Toronto FC, where you were really going in there, competing for a spot. What's that like mentally to know that you know you're in there trying out, and you know what were your options had it not worked out? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, trying out. And not being on a contract is stressful alone. But then my situation was even worse. I was trialing and having a, a son in uh, in February of that of that year. So it was even more stressful for for me. So um, yeah, it's it's definitely not a situation many want to be in. But um, I think it also helped me learn a lot about myself um, during that three month process of not having a contract. So. Yeah, it was definitely tough. There were days where um, that were better than than others and some very dark days as well. But uh, I think, again, it, it helped me learn so much about myself, the levels that I could uh, commit myself to. You know, I could have taken maybe you could say the easier route and maybe try to go away from MLS and just uh, go to a different league and just make sure I had a contract instead of I wanted to – uh, be uncomfortable and I believe in myself so I knew that I could still play at this level even though I'm sure many many didn't which is which is fine but um I think I learned a lot about myself in that sense and then in terms of a backup plan um to be honest with you I didn't I didn't really have one I I just had my um eyes set on TFC and I'm like it's it's this or nothing really that's what I had in yeah in my head and I remember my dad actually telling me that he's like don't think of the what ifs just this is it. You're gonna you're gonna go and you're gonna you're gonna sign a contract with this team. So that's yeah. all all I really had in my head at the time. Yeah, Rich. Speaking of learning new things, you learned to a new position with TFC and uh, you've excelled there. But uh, for most of your career, you played through the middle of the park uh, as a defensive midfielder, or a central midfielder, even the, an attacking midfielder. How was that transition moving from the middle of the park out to right back? Yeah, it was, to be honest, at first, I thought it would be a lot harder than it ended up being. But again, the way that uh, Greg Vanny wanted to play his right backs um, where sometimes I'm stepping into midfield, sometimes I'm higher than the midfield and I'm in a very good attacking position. So it was 
you know, it was stuff that I was doing in the midfield. Now that I'm just doing it from a different position and I'm having to obviously learn a few different things in terms of defensive shape and all that, but it wasn't, it wasn't as bad as I thought it would, uh, it would be uh, learning process wise. Obviously there, I think there's still a whole lot out there for, for me to learn about the position still, but so far I think it's been pretty good. And I think with me playing number eight in the, in the past kind of correlated pretty nicely into the way Greg Vanya wants to play mm-hmm. and John Herdman want to play their outside backs. Yeah, how does it help having that vision going from the middle to the right back and having that vantage point, being able to see absolutely everything from right back? Do you feel like that's a, a benefit to you? Yeah, I definitely have a lot more time on the ball than yeah. I had when I was at in the center midfield. So that's that's a plus, and I feel like I'm a player that's pretty comfortable on the ball. So it's I think it suits uh, the way I, I want to play, and yeah, it helps me see I have a lot more options on the field, and also. I've got uh, through through working with Greg Vanny and his staff, I've got to enjoy the attacking side of it as well, where I find myself in pretty good positions going forward yeah. as well. You came into TFC's camp. Um, were you told that, you know, in order to make this club that we need you to show that you can perform as a right fullback? And, and how, how big of a challenge has that been for, for, for your career? And, yeah, the first two games I was actually playing in midfield in preseason, and then um, they had an injury at right back. So I remember them looking around, and then Robin Frazier actually came to me, um, and he's like, okay, we're going to need you. I just played 90, but in preseason, <laughs> you usually do two cut-up 90s. So there was, I think there maybe 45 minutes into the second second game. He's like, hey, we're going to need you to go play 45 minutes. Uh, I was like, okay, no problem. And I was getting up. He's like, yeah, but you're going you're gonna to have to play right back. I was like, okay. <laughs> I, I couldn't say a whole lot. I didn't have a contract. I couldn't say no. So I was like, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll give it a go. I went out there. I thought I did a, a decent job. And then we did film the next day. And I tell the story all the time, but I speak to Robin Frazier to this day. And he's, uh, you know, someone that's uh, really helped me along in my career. And he completely chewed me apart in film after I played right back. He was, what are you doing here? Why are you so wide? Uh, why'd you make this pass? And I was like, wow, I don't know if I want to play this position ever again, (laughs) ever again. So um, it's funny. I tell that story all the time about my transition to right back, because I remember it so clearly without being on a contract, him just chewing me apart, chewing me apart in front of everyone on the team. So it was an eye opener for me, I think. And it made me not want to be chewed apart again by a, by a coach in front of everyone. So I think that also helped me a lot. Now that you've kind of established yourself in the league, do you see yourself maybe going back to midfield uh, at some point, or are you, do you kind of see yourself as a right back now? Um, I wouldn't. I definitely wouldn't mind going back into the midfield, but also if I were to play right back for the rest of my career, I wouldn't mind that either because I think I've found to really love the position now and I thoroughly enjoy it, and I'm someone that likes to take on new things. So as soon as I knew I was signed and this is where I was going to play, I was watching as much film as I could, as I could watch, um, with coaches, you know, I was watching around the world, some of the best right backs to see what they do, you know, just learning new things. And then to see for myself where I started in March when I was right back to where I ended uh, in November after the U S game, it was, mm-hmm. it, for me, it was a nice timeline to look back. Cause I saw stuff that I wasn't doing particularly so well in, um, maybe April and May. And then now in October, it's like it's second nature to me. So it was, um, it was, it was really nice uh, in that aspect because I could see the growth. And I'm, I think I'm a person I really like to see the way I develop um, over courses of time. So when I saw where I was in March to where I am today, it was pretty, pretty nice and a good feeling for me to have. Mm-hmm. See, there's a lot of evidence out there you know, from across Major League Soccer that having you know, a diverse playing gra- background and being able to play in multiple positions can actually benefit you uh, when it comes to contract talks. Um, you know, given that you kind of had an entry level deal you know, coming to TFC, you know, what's your contract situation now? And have you have you been in talks to to improve your own situation? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, the, we've definitely been in contact, and there's been talks. So we're, I know we're trying to get to some sort of agreement and Ali and Bill Mannion have been really open with my agent and it's been a good conversation obviously now because the coronavirus we're a little bit um 
on hold for everything in life at the moment. But I'm sure once we pick back up, um, hopefully I'm able to strike a new deal with um, with the club. You scored a, a massive, massive goal uh, in uh, last year's playoffs against BC. Um, how big of a milestone was that for you? And, and, and just a massive confidence boost to, to not cap the season because you guys went on to, to play an MLS Cup, but just kind of cap what you've what you've been able to do over the last you know twelve days, eighteen months. Yeah, I mean that week was probably the biggest week of football that I've played in my life. I went we that's right before we played against the US and then I think it's four days later we played against DC both at BMO. So um yeah I th- that was definitely a moment I'm gonna remember for the rest of my life because you know I've obviously watched TFC growing up and I've watched TFC closely in twenty once I entered the league especially I went to the twenty sixteen and seventeen final over at BMO. So I knew how electric uh BMO is on playoff night. So knowing that was the first time uh, TFC was going to play a playoff game since the final in 2017. I just felt it was a really big buzz and around the stadium and the city. So to score that goal was was massive for me. And yeah, it's definitely going to be up there in my milestones for my career as of right now. And then you also went on to make a big impact against NYCFC off the bench as well, winning the penalty. Um, can you maybe take us through a little bit how you prepare to, to come off the bench? Are you watching opposition weaknesses? Are you talking to the coaches? How, how do you kind of approach that? Yeah, um, I, I think all of us on the bench normally do because, because Greg is, is actually pretty good about it where he's also very, he's very intrigued and focused on the game, but then he's also relaying information off to guys on the bench. He'll turn around and be like, oh, did you see that? Did you see how... I don't know, for example, how far wide uh, Nico Benizé was on that play. He should have been tucked in. So it's like now, not for me, but for a winger that's on the bench, it's like, okay, like when I go and I know I'm not supposed to be that wide, you know? So it's, you know, you're con- it's not like we're sitting there and we're like sitting and uh, enjoying and enjoying and just watching the game. <laughs> you're focusing to see what areas you can improve once you get on the field. And I think that's something that I had to learn while coming here because I saw that in a bunch of guys you see guys come off the bench and become game changers where on other teams guys just come off the bench because it's like okay there's 10 minutes left I'll go see what I can do but here it's like guys want to make an impact so mm-hmm. yeah, that's that's what I saw I saw um, the left back was getting kind of tired and a little bit lazy in the way he was defending so I just um, I knew it myself but Greg reminded me he's like hey just go at him it's uh there's 10 minutes left like let's just see um how far you can push him. And that's what I did. I tried to go as, at him as many times as I could. And I think maybe that was my second, it may have been my first or second attempt actually trying to go at him. And I, he gave away a penalty for us. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting to hear you talk about Greg like that. I just want to know what your relationship, uh, how close you are with Greg Vanning. He obviously trusts you in that position. Um, what have you learned from him and what kind of coach uh, is Greg Vanning in particular? Yeah. I mean, as a coach and a, and, a, and a human being, he's a, he's an awesome, awesome guy and a great uh, coach. I think, I mean, I don't know all the coaches off the top of my head uh, in the league, but I say he's for sure, without a doubt in the top three of them. And he's just, you know, the way he sees football, it's like no other. And it's, um, mm-hmm. it makes me, I said, as soon as I came to Toronto, see, I felt like I was in a European environment with the, from the, facilities to the staff to the way we do film it's you know very detailed it's um you know instead of me being here it's like no push over a yard or some of that you know where as other teams it's not that doesn't matter it's like okay he's in and around the area here it's no I need you to be here not there and it's like at first for me I was like why are these guys being so anal about this this is this is crazy I I'm, I'm a step over and then you see it in the game, though. He's um, it just helps with you know where where you need to receive the ball and different positions you need to be in. So um, yeah, I have, a, I have a really good relationship with him. A lot of respect for him, obviously, and he's he's the reason why I am where I am today as well. So I have him and his staff to to thank for that. Just touched on one of the differences then between maybe your your former club and in Toronto FC. Um, I think a lot of people might see similarities in Orlando City and the big playoff drought they've had, and that's what TFC went through earlier in their career. Um, but what are some other differences maybe you can talk about between uh, Orlando City and now coming to, to Toronto? 
Yeah, I mean, coming to Toronto at the time that I did, they were obviously on a great run and doing really incredible things within the league and outside of the league as well. So um, I don't know, it's just that culture. They have the winning culture here. They have a winning mentality. They have, you know, from top to bottom where guys want to win from the from Bill Manning all the way down to the academy coaches. You know, it's structured. It's everyone's playing a certain way. So it was, you know, extremely organized and structured here. Whereas in, in Orlando, obviously, I was there, I think, the second year of the existence. Yeah, second year that they were. So it was a lot of growing for the club and for players. And coaches are coming in and out. There's not a clear identity. Are we a possession team? Are we going to be a team that hits people on the break? So there was a lot of give and take within the, um, within the group. And I think the team's always brought in pretty good players, but I just don't think there's a clear identity and formula mm. for the, for the, for the team right now. So I think that was one of the big differences and just, you know, I think structure is a very big thing in football for a, a club to have and Toronto FC definitely has it down to the T and I think Orlando's still working and trying to figure out um, what theirs is going to be, you know? So I know they're still fairly new and I know TFC, like you said, went through their growing pains as well as a club to see where they, where they um, stand within the rest of the group. So I'm sure uh, they'll, they'll get it sorted out sooner or later in Orlando, but just as of right now, I think that's one of the biggest differences within the two clubs. Yeah, Richie, I wanted to go back to your formative years and, and when you were coming through the system quickly as well. Um, obviously, you were one of many uh, notable graduates now from from Sigma FC and with Bobby Smyrniotis in, in Mississauga. Can you tell us a little bit about um, you know coming through that system and, and how important that was to, to your growth as a young player? Yeah, it was it was immense for me. Um, again, it was a place where there's great structure. It's uh, Bobby ran ran the club as if it was a European um, club. We modeled everything we did to Ajax's youth academy. So mm-hmm. it was, um, you know, a lot of, again, detailed stuff where um, at a young age, you don't realize why you're doing it. But then now as, um, as a 25-year-old, I realize exactly why. Bobby was taking us through um, certain situations that he was. So he's very, very big for where I am today. He's helped me a lot. The clubs helped me, helped me a lot. And yeah, just the exposure they were able to give not only myself, but everyone within the club with universities and also academies in Europe and within the national team as well. It was um, really good. And I think at one point, Sigma was probably doing it better than any club in the co- entire country was yeah. actually doing it. So it was, it was very nice to be able to be a part of, you know, maybe a club that not many people knew about. I was one of the first guys to join. I didn't know which way it goes. So to look back 10, 10 plus years ago now and to see how far the clubs come and what they've done for so many players is remarkable. Yeah. And, uh, Saw Bobby Smirny Otis have success in his first year of the Canadian Premier League. I want to get your thoughts on the CPL. Is it something you would have considered coming out of college uh, if it were available for you? Yeah, 100% would have, especially if Bobby was, um, if I knew Bobby was going to be a coach, I, yeah. I definitely would have considered it because I know how um, much of a winner and how big of a heart he has. So I know that it would have been a good organization to, to be a part of. So, yeah, I think 100% I would have. But just in terms of league, I'm extremely happy that there is a league in Canada because I, I've said this to many people. I think one of the biggest uh, downfalls I had growing up was that I know many players who aren't playing anymore, which were in and around the level of me and other peers that are not mm-hmm. professionals or even better. But they just there was no out. It was either in Toronto, you, you go to TFC's academy and hopefully you sign a first team deal. And then if you don't, then what? It's like there's a there was a weird transition where guys are trying to go to other places trying to go to montreal trying to go to vancouver but they already have their own setups there and you know guys try to go over to europe in the second third division and it didn't really work out so it's it it was it was tough back then so i'm definitely happy that they have this now because this is going to be a good stepping stone for a lot of young players to transition from being an 18 year old or a 17 year old boy to now sign in a deal at 18 and now you're playing in a professional Canadian league, which um, I think has caught many by surprise um, with how good of the, of a level it is. And, 
you know, not only with Forge, even I was impressed with Calgary, the run that they had in the um, in the Canada Cup, and they they came close to to beating Montreal. So, you know, it's uh really good to see as a, as a first year of the league existing. It was probably better than a lot of people thought it would be. Yeah, I think we all felt the same way, Richie. That's all the time we have. We want to let you get back to your family. Thank you so much for coming on with us and uh, spending a little time uh, out of your day with us and with all the fans. Uh, for Kurt Larson, Oliver Platt, I'm Asa Raymond. Adam Jenkins is back with uh, Peshawak in Delhi uh, tomorrow on The Hangout. So definitely want to tune in for that. Till next time, see ya. See you guys. Thanks, Richie. Thanks so much, Richie. Are we offline now?